Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be looking at Proxmox version 7.0 right after this. So Proxmox 7.0, what's new? What, what is this thing about? Let's take a look at it. So the first thing we know about Proxmox is it was released in, on July the 6th of 2021. Some of the system requirements that they talk about here are a little comical, but I mean, if all you're doing is evaluating the system, then yeah, this is probably all you need to worry about, <laughs> but I don't think you're going to be doing a whole lot with it. Uh, you need a 64-bit CPU. You need to have the Intel VT or AMD V capable CPU and motherboard to allow you to enable that uh, those features. So the other thing you need is one gig of RAM for the operating system, and you'll need enough operating enough memory for your each of your guest OSs. Now you can get by with some pretty lightweight uh, virtual machines, depending upon what you're doing. I mean, if it's a server, you could. You know, half a half a meg, or half a gig would be fine, and then one gig if you're the larger ones, if you wish, if you're just kicking the tires and trying to figure it out. So, uh, you'll also need a hard drive of some kind and a network card in order for you to be able to access the the uh, web interface as well as be able to get to your VMs when they're running. Uh, I would assume you're probably using SSH or maybe some other way of uh, viewing the GUI remotely from another machine. So. That being said, uh, what about the system requirements that they actually recommend? Well, the, it's still the same, 64-bit, you need a VT-capable machine, but in addition to that, if you're planning to do any pa hardware pass-through, you'll need a uh, CPU which, cap which supports VTD or AMD-D flags, and that, of course, would be both the CPU and the motherboard BIOS in order to enable those features. Uh, you'll need 2 gig of RAM as their recommendation for the operating system and then whatever RAM you need for each of your uh, guest OS. But in addition to that, don't forget, if you are running Ceph or ZFS, you'll want to have additional memory set aside for those as well. And there are rules of thumb in the documentation. I'm not going to cover those here. I mean, there's lots of ways that you can manage your ZFS pools and your Ceph pools. You might trade performance off, but if you're really doing this for a production environment, obviously you're not going to want to trade off performance at all. So you'll uh, storage. They recommend a OS storage pool, and that would be our redundant. They do recommend using SSDs or NVMEs for just simply because of performance. Uh, the VM storage. They still recommend SSDs or VM or NVMEs. However. Uh, hard drives will work as well in that environment, but you just make sure you have it in the appropriate configuration to provide additional bandwidth. Uh, as far as network cards, you'll probably need one or more. Typically in production environments, you keep your OS on your, your network management layer or your VLAN for your network management, and then you typically use uh, uh, a VM uh, or, excuse me, a virtualized network or you might use hard hardware networks for your uh, for your systems or you may balance them out you know for here or for there something like that it is based on Debian 11 bullseye uh, but it's not using the default Debian kernel it's using a newer kernel 5.11 so you, you do have some extra extra hardware support there and that's good to see uh, as far as Lexi, it it is version 4, and that does bring with it some, some concerns, and we'll talk about that. QEMU 6.0, and that, of course, has the IO RNG support in it. And uh, we talked about that when I was doing a review of Ubuntu 2104 and also a Fedora 34. Uh, OpenZFS is version 2.04, and that's good to see, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more. Ceph Pacific 16.02, but also Ceph uh, Octopus 15.2 is also supported. ButterFS storage technology is offered in uh, Proxmox 7.0, and of course that allows you to have sub-volume snapshots and RAID and self-healing and checksumming and all that stuff. 
The, there's also a new repositories panel that's been added, and that just creates a ease of management for your repos. You don't have to jump down to the command line anymore to manage that. If you want to have your uh, web interface configured so that your users are authenticating with an external server, uh, Proxmox 7 now supports an, a single sign-on with OpenID Connect. So you don't have to have a separate ID set up in Proxmox and passwords and all that stuff. Uh, so Lexi 4 has full support for Secrets version 2, and we'll talk about that. There is, a, of course, a reworked Proxmox installer environment for this, and so we'll cover that when I do the demo. Uh, probably won't be today. Uh, the uh, Acme standalone plugin that allows you some additional support for if you're running dual stacked IPv4 and IPv6 networks. Uh, they have implemented IPB, uh, IF up down two uh, to replace the older method of doing it, which I believe was just IF up down. So yeah, that's the default for new installations. You're, if you're coming up on an upgrade, it'll still remain on the older one. That's my understanding. We'll find out. Uh, there are some issues uh, with some of the uh, NTP uh, applications under Linux, and so Proxmox has moved to Crony. I can tell you that, yeah, there's you can get yourself in a hole no matter which which way you're using it, but uh, Crony is a lot better than the older versions of uh, NTP services. It also automatically, uh, Proxmox version 7 automatically recognizes a high DPI uh, uh, console, so if you have that, it'll recognize it. Uh, BusyBox is updated to 1.33.1, .1, and if you look at my Alpine videos, it'll talk to you about what BusyBox actually does. That's, of course, your core utilities and your user bin and user S bin. Uh, backups can now be encrypted using a master key, and I think that's a nice change to have. And there's just a lot more stuff. If you were interested, you can go and look at the release notes, but I am going to call out some specific things. Uh, one is, is, is there is now a markdown uh, language that's implemented in the web client for Proxmox. And that gives you an additional place to take notes and be able to, you know, do emphasizing and all that kind of stuff and grouping and paragraphs and all that stuff and then helping to make it a nice clean document that it, it stays with your VM host. Now, in larger environments, that would be very important to have. Because if you're making changes, that allows you to make changes to a single place, and then everybody sees the same document and knows what you've done. <clears throat> For example, ISO file downloads can now be performed from a URL. So in the past, you had to download it first and then tell it where it was on your file system. So in doing that, you can have it download the SHA file, the SHA-256 file, to verify the ISO download with it. I don't know what their plans are for some of the other methods of verifying, but SHA-256 is fine, uh, and that will work just great. And so after it downloads, it'll verify it and then let you know if it, if it did verify or not. Uh, some of the things that are in the new repo management is you can add, enable a repo, or disable a repo, or you can delete it. Uh, so, yeah, so for example, if you don't want to buy a subscription to Proxmox, you can enable the non-subscription uh, based repos. Uh, the other thing that I noticed on the older 6.4 Proxmox is that um, VM snapshots were being left on the storage pool even after I deleted the VMs, and, and this version cleans that up and gets rid of that problem. Yeah, I just had to go in and manually do it. It's not a big deal, but you know, it's something to think about. If you leave a bunch of those snapshots out there, pretty soon you're going to run out of disk. Uh, ButterFS. ButterFS is an optional install target. So they recommend that you use RAID 1 uh, for the install. And I would not recommend using ButterFS at all, but you know that's your choice. If you want to risk your environment with RAID, go right ahead. Uh, as far as I know, the RAID configurations under ButterFS are still not certified for production use. So, yeah, I wouldn't, I mean, if you're going to use ButterFS in a simple environment, fine, but I would not use the ButterFS RAID. There's other ways you could implement RAID, like on top of an LVM, for example. So, you might want to look at that versus using ButterFS. That's the, 
Anyway, I'm not going to get into that here, but th just remember, this is a technology preview. That means this is not recommended for production use. So if you're upgrading from Proxmox 6.x, there's some caveats that you might be aware of. For example, if you're on an older version of Proxmox 6.2 or 6.3, they recommend that you update it to 6.4 first and then start your upgrade process to 7. That just prevents you from running into issues that you, that, during the migration. This does not have anything to do with a clean install. Of course, you can always clean install in version 7. Yeah, they recommend that you run the PBE 6 to 7, and that will go do validation checks on your environment. It just makes sure that you don't have any configurations that are kind of broken or left over. Like when I ran it, I had uh, an older cluster config that I had set up at one time, and part of it was still set up in there. And it found it, and it complained about it, and so I cleaned it up, and I just kept running it until it came clean. So, yeah, you, you'll need to do that. Um, and then you can also run it with a TAC TAC full. Now, this is only showing a single TAC, but there's two. That's just the way. That's, that is an anomaly of this, this uh, display software for the for the uh, power for the uh, the screen the screen forms. So anyway, it'll check all possible upgrade issues if you run it with the full. So you're very interested in that. Also, if you're once you've created a VM on the version seven environment, you can't migrate it from that platform a seven environment over to a one, a Proxmox environment that's running six. So if you have older clusters in your environment and you're trying to move a VM that was created under 7 and didn't go to run over on the 6 because there are major differences in the way the configuration is structured. So just be aware of that. Now, I don't think that impacts VMs that were created under 6. I think you can move those around, of course, like you did before, even up to 7. And, and they didn't really talk about that, but we'll test it. See if that actually works. Uh, there's also some issues with the C group version 2 that may cause a CentOS 7 or an Ubuntu 16.10 based virtual machine to fail to run. So, and the reason for that is those two versions don't support C groups version 2. So, yeah, you could run into issues with those VMs no longer operating. Yeah, they're just, they're, they're just no compatibility in, in there for version 2. So what do they recommend? You can up, now they say to upgrade from CentOS 7 to 8. I wouldn't recommend doing that because CentOS 8 is going to be gone current on, on current plan at the end of December. I don't know if Red Hat is going to extend that. Uh, I, haven't, I, I haven't actually been tracking it, so maybe you guys know if they have or not. The last I heard, they weren't. Uh, so... Um, yeah, I don't think that'd be a good pass. So you might want to look at alternatives. I have some videos on some alternatives you can look at now. My requirements are going to be different from yours. So I chose a migration to Debian, but that may not be right for you. You may decide to go to Rocky Linux, or you may go to Alma Linux, or you may go to v, uh, v Linux, VZ Linux, uh, or something else like that. There's also there's some other commercial-based uh, RHEL based systems that are 100% compatible with RHEL. But you see the documentation, There's they'll give you more options and more complex details to look at than I'm planning on doing here. And of course for Ubuntu, you can you can just migrate, you can migrate in place your VMs from 16.10 up to 18.04 or 20.04. So yeah, and then, then they recommend once you've done the upgrade, you know, before you do the upgrade, run the PV uh, performance tool to see what your baseline performance is. That's a real simple benchmark. So, yeah, if you're going to do things like benchmark your file systems and see what that impact is, I would recommend using more, um, a little deeper analysis, the uh, tools like FIO, FIO, or IO Zone 3. Yeah, I would recommend doing that versus doing the PV performance tool. You might also want to benchmark the uh, operating system environment as well, just to see what the difference is in the kernel performance coming from the kernel version on 6 to 7, for example. So that's always a, a, a good idea to do, just to see how you're, if you are suffering any degradation in performance. Uh, typically, there, there's just more code as you go up, and so it isn't too hard to degrade performance from one environment to another. 
But Proxmox recommends that you use more detailed tests, and they have some recommendations and documentation for that. But if all you're wanting to do for your home server is just snapshot and just see, okay, where do I actually stand? Yeah, it's probably good enough for that. What's still missing? So what's still missing is the OVF. That is, that is a file format which allows you to export and import easily a VM from one environment to another. Say, I want to migrate a whole bunch of VMs from ESXi. Uh, I can do that. So I can I can export in OVF format, and it will keep my settings information, how much memory, what, where my drives are, and so forth. Uh, and I did get some comments on my last video about Proxmox. Well, hey, you know, you can't open up that OVF file and just use the raw. I am aware of that. I know that. But my point is that's probably fine for a 1Z, 2Z migration. But if you're actually migrating a very large VM host or a cluster of VM hosts, uh, no way would I want to sit there and do that for 400 VMs. But, hey. Anyway, I, I'm still thinking that that should be a thing. Uh, that is a fo an industry format. And a lot of other virtual ma machine environments do support it. So, uh, yeah, I think Proxmox had to add that to their capabilities list for a future roadmap. I am not going to do a demo today, so I'm just going to move on to the summary. I'll do a separate video on the demo. So I guess in summary, it's good to see that we're, we're going to use a modern Linux environment. I like the fact that Ceph is supporting both the new and the old environments. Typically, when you get into uh, very large shared clustered storage environments, you know, in several hundred uh, terabytes all the way up to petabytes worth of storage, typically you're not going to want to upgrade that environment without a, a thorough test. So, yeah, you hate to come in one morning and find all that data gone or destroyed or damaged. Yeah, you probably would be picking up your hat and headed for the door. So, uh, more than likely, um, yeah, not a good thing to have happen. So, you, you would want to test that first, and it's good to see you can have it support the old environment before you move to the new. ZFS is now compatible with uh, BSD on version 2.04, and there are some bug fixes in there as well. So... I'm glad to see that, that it still allows me to use ZFS and maybe I snapshot to a BSD machine. Gives you some flexibility anyway. So, that is all I had today. And I hope you enjoyed this video today. Um, I think, yeah, I'll do a demo on it. I'll show you a couple things that I want to do. I'll show you. I'm going to try to do the install. I'll try to do the migration from uh, 6 to 7. We'll go through the tools and uh, and also the uh, uh, performance benchmark and just see how that all works. But hope to see you all again real soon. Please like and subscribe, and bye for now.